Mr. Mark Selby, how are we, sir? I'm doing very well, Mr. Matthew Gordon. I'm glad to hear it. Have you been on the road? I have, yes. I was in Washington after I was in uh, Korea and Japan after I was in South Africa. So, Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Well, I think you told us a little bit of what's going on in South Africa potential uh, over there, which, which is great. Um, Asia, what, what, what can you tell us? Yeah, no, Korea, Japan, uh, uh, again, all all good. Uh, we were quite fortunate. We, we got to, to um, uh, uh, see uh, Samsung uh, battery plant, um, see, see it actually come together up close, which was great, um, and then had uh, a bunch of good meetings with uh, the you know, next set of potential uh, investors in the project. Uh, so it uh, it's great. You know, again, a lot of Asian companies uh, are you know quite good at seeing past this month's noise and you know looking you know focused on the longer term prize, which uh, which is great. So right. Well, actually, talking of this week, this week's noise or last week's noise, actually, um, nickel price seems to be. It's all bouncing around a fair bit. So what's happening? Yeah. So since we last talked two weeks ago, um, we popped all the way up to almost twenty thousand dollars a ton about seven months earlier than than I thought we were going to get there. Uh, we came a few hundred dollars short, um, and as you know, expected as you're consolidating, uh, you know, we've now round tripped. I think we're down to about eighteen thousand six hundred this morning. Again, still three thousand dollars off the bottom. So no need to panic at this point. This is typical consolidation. Uh, bouncing around again, LME inventories uh, had dropped down to about the mid seventy thousand ton level. Um, bounced back up, uh, you know, over the last week and into the high seventy thousand tons. You know, I, I think the key thing is, you know, you know that this price move up. Uh, you know, back in January we talked about you know record level short positions, and so that gave me a lot of comfort in terms of, you know, being able to call that bottom and and likely seeing some sort of uh, price bounce uh, off of that. And yeah, no. So what's happened is that, you know, we've seen that big, big net record net short position basically go to a small net long at this point in time. So, you know, whenever you get, get something sort of, you know, right around the balance market, you know, you'll see prices whip around because, you know, uh, on either side of a number, because you know people are don't really have much conviction one way or the other yet, um, and or they're not in a panic because they're so exposed in one direction that they need to be worried that the market market uh, is is going to bounce you know bounce back. So, um, you know, so a- again, I expect to see you know a bunch of fluctuations in this kind of a you know eighteen to twenty thousand dollar ton price range uh, until we see. Some more more signs of physical demand is continuing to pick up a, again on the iron ore market. Iron ore price is moving higher. I, I always like that as a good indicator of where the Chinese economy is because, you know, at, at the end of the day, you don't stockpile a lot of iron ore as a speculative hedge. Um, um, uh, you know, in in terms of where the economy is going. So if if you're starting to see iron ore prices go up, it's a pretty pretty good sign that the you know physical market itself is 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 improving. Uh, you know, to some extent, absolutely, absolutely. And now, um, we we talked. And obviously, you've just been at this conference in, in Washington D.C. as well. I suspect you, you probably heard it for a bit there. But we've always been kind of clear to talk about how the battery metals tend to act in 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 unison. You know, in in, in patterns, but certainly in in, in unison. Um, what are we seeing on some of those other uh, metals like copper, lithium, etc.? Yeah. So those of you who are who regularly watch, you would remember sort of five six months ago, I said. You know, some of my favorite uh, signals are flashing bright green. Um, so maybe it's the time to pick up some copper. Uh, we've now seen most of the mid-tier copper names, you know, the TSX, Capstones, to Seiko's Hut Bays of the world. You know, they're up a good 75 to 100%. Uh, since that time frame, copper prices are pushing 10000 bucks a ton. You know, if if I had money in those names, I think now would be, you know, a good time to do it because those, those green sit, those... Those same signals that were flashing green before are now flashing red. So uh, uh, I, I don't think you're going to see, you know, prices might get up for, a, we might have one more little push higher to 10, 11,000 bucks a ton, but I, I don't think the fundal mar- fundamental market is there. So I think you're going to see copper prices consolidate, you know, in, in this kind of nine to $10,000 a ton range, you know, for the next while. So, um, you know, that's uh, just, just, a, just a heads up for for those of you who, who might have paid attention to that last Buy signal, right? But but kind of, kind of like nickel, you're saying that it, a bit of price consolidation for a while, maybe take some profits off the table if you if you've got some. But general trend is still stay long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think copper uh, 
you know, we need we need more copper projects. I mean, I think the thing to think about getting positioned is is look at you know what we haven't seen is the full cascade down the development chain yet. So, uh, you know, I would look just to, to pick out you know some names that are maybe earlier stage. Uh, you know, because I think we're going to be in, in a couple year development cycle here. Right. Okay. Okay. And and, and just again, we're always looking out for market forecasters and, and market signal, signal, signals. Uh, INSG put out their April forecast. What can you tell us? Yeah. So we've talked about the Nickel Study Group from time to time. And again, there are UN body that are there to sort of be the official number keepers. Um, and they meet twice a year. So they come out with their forecast. Uh, so, you know, the, the good thing is, and not unexpected, uh, that, you know, surpluses that they had reported back in October that was going to be, you know, up over 200 and, and you know, almost 250,000 tons this year is now down to a, just over 100,000 tons uh, surplus in 2024. Uh, the key thing to remember with these forecasts, and it's driven me bonkers for 20 plus years, uh, they're the only forecast that does not include a disruption allowance. So, um, you know, one of Andy Holm, one of the columnists, you know, who co covers commodities, was just talking about how INSG reported that there's going to be a surplus this year. The reality is, is if you take the INSG numbers, if you add a, you know, typical three to 5% disruption allowance, we're actually at a balanced to deficit market this year. You know, the INSG as well only has an 8% demand growth forecast. Remember, we did you know six percent plus last year in a lot of <laughs> negative headwinds. If we only do eight percent, yeah, I, my forecast is is has been you know that we're going to see double digit growth. You put those together, you know that lines up to a solid deficit forecast for for twenty twenty four. So, um, you know, so I, I I actually saw these numbers as 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 pretty bullish, you know, because because they tend to overestimate supply, underestimate demand, and these kinds of 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 market shifts for sure. So right, okay. Okay. Well, let let let's um, let's obviously as usual we'll stay on top of that. And forward now, the other uh, popular bit of this show seems to be uh, company news. Um, so we've got a fair bit of company news today, and we're going to start with uh, well, first Quantum. How are they faring these days? Yeah. yeah so there's been some goods and bads, um, and and actually you yeah, have a pretty jam packed news flow after a few quiet weeks. So yeah, first Quantum, uh, you know, confirmed their previously announced uh, shutting down mining at Ravensthorpe. Uh, so they have a bunch of lower grade soft piles there, so they can still produce nickel, um, but uh, they'll be you know running down their low grade soft piles and saving cash by not spending money on on, on mining uh, new new material. Uh, so you know that supply that's definitely you know coming out of the market. Uh, on the good news front, uh, Magna Mining um, got their permit to take water. Uh, the significance of that is out uh, they what to and to discharge water. Um, the significance of that is they need to start dewatering some of the old workings at the mine that they acquired, and and they're going to, to do that to be able to start doing their exploration development uh, ramp that will allow them to actually mine some more and get it processed. So, uh, you know, a path to you know to getting some some cash there. So, and you know, not not, a, not an unexpected move, but again, you know, permits uh, until you have them, you don't have them. So, uh, it was great to see on the Magna front, uh, FPX. Also, solid news um, from you know the the uh, Ultra Mafic team. Uh, you know they were uh, announced that they processed uh, pilot plant run of about seventy six tons. Uh, again, confirming you know their prior metallurgical performance, and, and they were looking at some process optimizations to further simplify their flow sheet. You know, and got some pretty good results on that front. So you know, again, kudos to Martin and team uh, for doing a great job there. Um, the the uh, turning over to uh, Australia. Ardia had announced an MOU earlier with Shanghai, not Shanghai, sorry, Sumitomo Metal Mining uh, and Mitsubishi uh, came back with a definitive agreement where they're going to form a joint venture for their uh, la nickel laterite project um, in Western Australia. Uh, S uh, SMM and Mitsubishi going to fund close to $100 million, uh, you know, uh, with a pathway to get to 50% of the project. I think the key here for those of you who are invested in any of the Aussie laterite stocks, this is or thinking about doing it. This will be a very key test. You know, this is most of the Australian laterites have been around since the 1970s. Um, this is, you know, kind of the, the the bigger and best one of the deposits of the next bunch uh, to get developed. Uh, SMM knows what they're doing. They've successfully built two HPAL projects. And so, you know, I think this feasibility study, which is targeted for the second half of 2025, 
you know, will be a key key indicator of what, you know, Australian HPAL cost structures are going to look like. So, um, so it'll be, it'll be one to watch as it goes forward. And then again, you know, good to see sort of some more IRA safe compliant nickel, uh, you know, uh, come to market. Um, and sticking with Australia, QPM. Yeah. So, uh, Queensland Pacific Metals, um, as now, uh, said we're going to be in a, a natural gas producer. So, uh, you know, their project was located, just located in close proximity to some gas fields, uh, and they're now sort of shelving their nickel project. Um, sadly, not surprised. Um, you know, the basis of their technology was nitric acid leaching, which, you know, been around for quite a while, you know, not shown to work um, at bigger scale. Uh, again, never say never, but, you know, I was always a little skeptical of this one. You know, unfortunately, they attracted a bunch of auto battery, you know, company investment. You had POSCO, LGES, GM all come in there. Their feasibility study in late 2022 had, you know, $27,000 ton nickel sulfate prices and $60,000 cobalt prices, you know, so, you know, quite, quite, you know, up off the end uh, of the scale. So again, not surprised to see that one parked. And I think we had made some comments about it uh, in the we past, did. but, but again, it's, it's tough because you just saw three downstream guys, you know, get some capital evaporated, um, you know, for uh, a nickel project. So. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 you know it's this it, and we're going to stick with Australia in a second as, as well. Um, this is why when you are looking at economic studies that come out, and you're looking at the headlines, you're looking at those bullet points at the top of the document. You got to look for those little asterisks where you, the assumptions made about the pricing environment is so so important. This is obviously a great case in point, um, and um, you know the IRRs. The NPVs, et cetera, are predicated on, you know, giving a realistic view of the market. Look for base cases and, and, and look for stretch cases. Um, but, you know, be, be conservative in your assumptions about the management's team's ability to be conservative. Uh, they've got to paint in the best possible light. And so that, that was the, that we, I know we've talked about it in the past, but it's just worth reiterating there. Um, and yeah, so the Aussies, Western, Western Mines, how are we getting on there? Yeah, so sort of switching back to disseminated sulfide land, um, Western Mines, we've mentioned them a few times, their Molga tank project. Uh, you know, again, getting some pretty good, um, you know, large the um, dunite, uh, all, you know, again, typical ultramafic type intervals, 0. 0.25, you know, 0. 0.2 to 0.3% nickel. Uh, what's interesting in some of their holes, you know, there's obviously a few higher grade structures running through there. So they've had some narrow, narrower, narrower intervals over 1%. And, and again, this this does occur um, with, with uh, some of these deposits. So so good to see it's just east of it's east of Calgary. So, you know, that's one to keep an eye on. You know, their head of exploration work started his career <laughs> or, you know, spent a lot of time at Mount Keith, uh, again, which is a grandparent of those deposits. So you know, that's one to keep an eye, you know, continue to keep an eye on um, as it moves forward. Um, and then coming back to Canada on the disseminated front, uh, our neighbors down the road uh, from Timmins, uh, Aston Minerals, uh, announced a great set of metallurgy work. So, you know, uh, recoveries uh, from their Boomerang Bardwell project. Uh, and again, got good recovery numbers to good grade concentrate. Uh, they, they showed the flow sheet um, in, in the press release and it may look very similar to another flow sheet for another project uh, that uh, I, I, I may watch. So again, great to see. And again, you know, helping, uh, you know, Ton Laco, we think is going to be the world's biggest nickel sulfide district. Yeah. Uh, like I said, they, they, these names, you know, they keep, keep um, reappearing, you know, mostly for the right reasons, sometimes not. Um, 